So I'm here in Edinburgh, Scotland. And I'm here looking for one very specific clothing item. To be honest, I've actually been looking for this since April. And not just in Scotland, but in five different countries. Sweden, France, Germany. This is insane. Switzerland, England, Scotland. But I'm not very optimistic right now. I think I'm missing a few places. <laughs> The point that I'm trying to make is that this isn't something that I've just been looking for a couple of days. I've been invested in this for months now. I realized that the problem is much more than just finding a piece of clothing. Welcome to another episode of Rewired. Today, we cover this elusive piece of men's clothing. Let's talk about that. Hello and welcome to Switzerland. Welcome to Paris. Welcome to Stockholm. And now, welcome to London. This is me in the fifth month of trying to find this piece of men's clothing. Earlier this year, I was watching this film Equilibrium and Christian Bale was wearing this long black slick coat. And I was like, I want that. What is that? Quick Google search later, I figured out that it's called a trench coat. It's a subcategory of waterproof coats created by the Scottish chemist Charles Mackintosh and British inventor Thomas Hancock in the early 1820s. However, it was first popularized for the masses by a young Thomas Burberry with his inventive gabardine fabric, which was ultra breathable despite being waterproof. This trench coat quickly found a place amongst adventurous men, explorers, and aviators. But at the turn of the century, it found a very peculiar customer, men at war. Women's, women's, women's. And everywhere I went, I found this pattern. Whilst men's trench coats were nowhere to be found, women's section were filled with them. Men's ka same thing. How strange it looks. Now, this was quite interesting given how men's centric the origin of trench coat was, and now it was nowhere to be found. But then men's section didn't have much to offer anyway. Could this possibly be related? And after about thinking for 10 hard seconds, I realized that it, it definitely is. We don't have the same sort of options as women because we wear the same thing again and again and again. Quite interestingly, a few centuries ago, men's wear looked like this. There were so many layers, there were so many patterns, so many textures. And I mean, just look at just how many options we have in terms of choosing a collar. Look at this. But what happened? How did we end up looking like this all the time? A little something called the French Revolution. So this was now the Victorian era, right after the French Revolution. And men were like, we don't want to look like this because the rich people look like this. So all these men thought that we need to stand up against the rich. We need to stand up against the capitalism, the inequality amongst men, of course. We need to do something about it. And we need to create a universal symbol of brotherhood. And they decided that it would look something like this. A suit, a tie, and a shirt. I just want to remind you that we're talking about the 1800s here. But I would not blame you if you think that this looks very familiar. <laughs> now look, I understand that men do not adopt to trends as quickly as other genders, but it has literally been centuries. 1800s was 200 years ago. And the problem isn't just about looking like what we used to 200 years ago. It's fine, that's your choice. The problem is that the sense of brotherhood has kind of taken a form of moral policing. Take a look at anyone who's tried to differ from this trend and you can see other men perhaps policing them as to how ridiculous they look. So if you ever happen to do something which is barely out of the ordinary, you will either be ridiculed by other men or you will be left very, very disappointed. <laughs> And this is why men can't have nice clothing. 
or is it? What if I told you that in order to find this quote, all you have to do is travel back in time and find the place where it all began? Chal bhai, chal. Two thousand pounds. After going through what I went through for five months, I only came to the realization that in order to afford this thing, all I need to do is be homeless for one month. So it would be an understatement to say that I was thoroughly uh, disappointed. And I'm looking for somebody to put this blame on. And I think I found the culprit. Marketing. Okay, yes, hear me out. It's gonna be interesting, I promise. I think men's fashion marketing is such an untapped fucking marketplace. It just boggles my mind that nobody has thought about this or nobody's doing anything about it. See, men don't know what to buy. They don't know what they want. They don't know what's good for them. So if somehow through marketing, you can push them in that direction, they will buy it. Let me give you an example. One second. This. This right here is one of the best selling products that Unilever has ever made. Do you know why people are buying this? Because this has fucking men written over it in bold capital font. It's as simple as that. Also, please don't use this as your shampoo. Please, for the love of God, please don't do that. I know you don't have hair left, but whatever it is, please, just, did, please, yeah? Thank you. To be honest, if I had to compare this with any other Dove product, I would just guess that apart from the fragrance choice, the ingredients might just be the same. So it's essentially the same thing packaged differently. That is what marketing can do. It can let you believe that this is somehow different than this. It's not. And this is how you create demand for a product that has existed for years now. Why can't you do that for men's fashion? Why can't men? You, you, have a, you have a big market here, man. Marketing people, you have a big market here. I don't know what the fuck are you doing. I have no idea. Okay, that's enough of the rant. I just hope that someday when a kid wants to buy a trench coat, he doesn't have to wait for it for six months. He doesn't have to go through 15 different countries just to understand that he has to sell his left arm or something like that to afford one. I just hope that one day he can just walk into an H&M, into a Zara, into a Primark and just see a collection of trench coats over there. Nicely put together, very comparable with the ladies section. You know, much like in the online space. Okay, so I found, found one online. Am I proud of it? We're not gonna talk about that. Um, it's fine, it's a bit, I, I probably need to get it tailored. This was such a fail. I should have, I couldn't find it anywhere. I had to buy it online. This was it from this, and I'll see you in a less disturbing place. Okay, that was quite anticlimactic. Or was it? Actually it was, yes. It was, it was very anticlimactic. And firstly, I would like to apologize for the gross generalization that I've done, both to men and women. <laughs> Speaking about gross generalization, there's something that men's fashion has that women's don't. <laughs> Pockets. And I'm making a video as to why is that the case. This looks quite nice. Yeah. But I need someone from the clothing industry to help me out with this. I have some questions as to why this is the case. Even a clothing historian would work. So if you are one or if you know somebody who is one, please reach out to me. You can use this email address. It's there in the description as well. And until then, thank you so much for watching. Huh? Okay. See you next time.